I I thought I might nice. sort of do a series of those because they were just, just fun to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, so. oh that's fantastic. Yeah. Madonna, I thought if we just began with your childhood and early life and what, how you see the significance of that. Your mother, um, Madge, a poet, also an artist, the, the books in the home, your time in Sydney. How's that played out in the present? I know in some of your most recent self-portrait uh, paintings, you refer to your mother explicitly in those. Yes, I think being an only child is... Um, no matter how caring the parents are for an only child, they have to learn to nurture themselves because, uh, and I think this is where imaginary playmates come in and all that sort of thing, and, and habitats, for instance, um, uh, an early form of um, an environment where I was happy was tucked in behind a big lounge chair in the corner of the dining room and that could be converted into all sorts of um, secret sanctums as it were where you, you you carried out ceremonies with your dolls and you made cups of tea for them and so on. I was um, probably four and a half or five and um, I had a doll that had a soft body it was just filled with straw or um, sawdust or something but the, the exciting thing about it was that I could pin scraps of fabric and uh, to it and create uh, all sorts of uh, bizarre and wonderful and fanciful costumes for this doll. And that's why I wondered where, later where I had a, um, um, maybe a career as a dress designer. Yeah. Collage. <laughs> Collage, yeah. <laughs> Collage the doll, yes. But I, I, I knew even at that age that I had a very tactile sense of, for instance, I can remember the handles on the, the, the interior doors were, car, were ridged like a beehive, and I can almost feel them in my hand today. And um, I seem to be able to make companions out of inanimate things. You describe yourself as self-educated. Mm. What about from school right through, and how, how did you self-educate? Well, I had a very painful uh, period where, because my father was sort of moving around from uh, various areas, there was no really um, current of uh, security physically or anything else until we went to um, Chatswood in Sydney and my father took on a, <coughs> a small private um, lending library and it was quite quite vast. I think it had about 3,000 volumes in it. Uh, from then on I don't think I ever looked back and um, I had very poor health that was left from uh, the measles because it affected my lungs. and. Um, I could retire up the steps, this was another terrace building, and uh, with the latest volumes of, oh, it might have been Anne of Green Gables or something, or something more intellectual or whatever, but um, yes, yeah, so I was, think I was always happy with a book. But what about numerals in your work, the numbers, you've often had numbers. All oh, right. Um, <coughs> well, I'm very bad at numbers. It was the area of education that I had the most trouble with. So I think they remained very mysterious, but challenging, uh, because I've never been able to decipher <coughs> what they were on about, you know. So <laughs> the only sort of numbers that I had any uh, success with were in music, actually. But um, it's, it's the mystery of them, I think. And as there's as an as aesthetic as. about them, would you say? Yes, yes. Mm. Uh, I think they just come under that numinous label again, you know. So, Madonna, what about sort of religion at that time? Catholicism mm. and then later your interest in Buddhism and mysticism and, yes, and how well, that um, mm. has worked? At this stage, um, and I had a period of being fairly content going to a local convent uh, in, in Chatswood, but then my <laughs> peripatetic father took off again up 
towards the. Uh, it's not the. Is it the Nepia River that Nepean, runs through French's yeah. Forest? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Bought some land up there where he could have his beloved horses. I think not long after that, um, my father decided that he wasn't going to spend another uh, winter in Sydney, so he was going back north to Moolumbah where I was ha ha was born in Moolumbah actually. And um, being sort of catapulted out of that heaven, you know, 3,000 books and no, no other um, contenders. <laughs> it was like going to a very strict boarding school where all the things which had been precious to me were uh, verboten. You know, uh, so that I think is a time when um, some sort of rebellion set in and I was old enough to sort of become interested in the beatniks and um, um, what was happening in poetry at that time in, in America and so on. So I started to look at these things and, uh, oh, in Sydney, my mother had taken me around all the uh, art galleries but it was a very, once again, a very uh, correct uh, view that was being exhibited. And um, uh, so, yeah, when we got to Brisbane, yes, um, Johnson Gallery, I suppose, was the most interesting thing that was happening. The only one. And I managed to make a few friends um, by attending some uh, live classes that were held with the Royal Queensland Art Society. And my mother was the secretary of that for, for about six years. But at that time, she came to the point, and maybe it was because I was doing what I was doing, it somehow freed her up and she started to uh, teach herself and, you know, uh, take part in a lot of activities and she was secretary of the art society and so on and she needed that desperately she was a very intelligent person but also I saw my mother as the victim in the marriage and I identified with her so we were mates you know my father said about me said about said to me about my mother your mother is a very foolish woman and I thought, oh God, you know, where do we go from here? Because, um, I mean, people can be foolish but still be the most lovable, precious people in the world, you know, if we've all got to go around being the, 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 the opposite to being foolish, it'd be a very dull world. But that seemed to me a terribly cruel thing to say about someone who'd suffered so much and uh, I mean I was her only child because she hadn't been able to have more children physically um, you know because of uh, the birth and so on and um, she had no we had nobody but each other we were like that you know there was no question that she was my my mum and my mate so what about Madonna, if we come through to your first exhibition, the 1976, mm. at Ray Hughes, would you say something about mm. you know, how you got there and the, the sort of work and that? Yes, well, I think what was so dreadfully innovating about living in Brisbane was the fact that you had to generate, you know, you know energies for yourself. There was very little, um, at, uh, you know, like, very, very little at, um, uh, I've got a, a thing in my mind about sort of fertiliser but, uh, and sort of uh, uh, grazing fields of intellect and ideas and images etc. And um, I think Ray certainly was the uh, <coughs> catalyst for a lot of that, the change that came about. And then because always sort of dogged by um, <coughs> the health issue, I started doing um, collage because uh, I decided that I'd do something that I'd enjoyed doing as a child. And um, not because I thought it was a childish activity, but something which liberated you in terms of um, um, the means it was still possible to uh, attain an end through means which weren't so physically exhausting and um, 
So I, I don't know how I came to put the pieces together that uh, I took to Ray, although I know that I'd come um, as a beneficiary from a foster aunt, a whole package of old letters and uh, they, the, the envelopes were lined, uh, they were lavender inside the envelopes, you know. Somehow I felt I could lift them above the level of nostalgia. So I had this, this group of crawlers, and I remember the day I took them to Ray, it was very funny really, because I had them in a f f um, folder and I let the folder up against the wall. He made a, a sort of a lurch towards the folder and I sprang back and he sprang back and then he let me spring forward and actually opened the folder and we had a look at them. And um, I, I think there's a real lack in communication between artists and curators and gallery dealers and so on. They lack um, uh, a vocabulary of approbation and pleasure, etc., as though if they uh, expressed too amenable, uh, a um, um, too, were, were too sort of seen to be um, acceptable, the, the accepting of the material that they were looking at, uh, it might compromise them. And um, on the other hand, they might go away and change their mind about it, or the artist might change their mind, or they might change their mind. So the first exposure is very, very sort of pregnant with all sorts of miscarriages. <laughs> so, so Madonna, that exhibition got really good reviews from Gertrude did, Langer and from Betty Churcher and really, Church, yes, yeah, yeah. any comment on that? And they talked about the sort of almost as if all the bits in the collage were in their perfect place where they had to be, yeah. that sort of formalist and quality. Um, yeah. I think, um, yeah, it was hard to, it was hard to, to sort of expose that type of vulnerability and, um, uh, let's say vulnerability, of the actual materials without giving way to uh, sentimentality or anything like that. I, I, I don't know how that happens. It's, uh, it's a certain rigour, you know. I think they talk about, uh, oh, Right, we'll have some intellectual rigour coming in on this scheme and see if we can't pull it into shape, you know. <laughs> so Madonna, you're a poet and an artist and a lot of people that write about your work talk about the poetry of materials and those sort of formalist yeah. aspects. Could you say something about the relationship between your poetry, words and your artwork? Um, Poetry is a vehicle where, for me, I can um, flesh out um, images that I might get from the most um, <coughs> abject of physical um, occurrences or items or whatever, because um, <coughs> It's like you pour some sort of an image, uh, of an energy into them. That's the energy that gets the thing ticking of, of what uh, is going to transform this, this abject, whatever it might be, abject or not. Um, and to always, uh, you know, sort of, um, <coughs> Uh, never to never to close the door on objective reality because it's always imbued with you know the sort of the seeds of poetry and sometimes the embryo that you you pick on is something that you didn't know was happening in your in your head anyway for instance this little poem was only a few lines, it said, um, um, I folded myself into the low, lower drawer of my bureau and my knees were as the peaks of the Austrian Alps and I waited 
and longed for my entombment. I mean, <laughs> I think that's the wackiest explanation I can put on that. I mean, where you could crawl into a piece of furniture and sort of have a vision of the Austrian Alps. And, and I wrote that to a friend and he was absolutely horrified. He said, what has soured your life, you know, <laughs> that you sort of, you, you, you want to die and locked up in a cupboard or something. <laughs> but, um, I mean, that's not a good example, but it just shows you how anything is a material for poetry, more or less, you know. It, and for your artwork as well. Yeah, yes. It? Mm. It's the poetry in the world. Mm. Yeah. You said somewhere else in um, an artist's statement that the production of art is really about self-analysis. Say something about that in relation to your work, sort of self-analysis yes. and that sort of superego, I suppose. Mm. Like, it seems to be chaos, but it's controlled at the point. Yeah, of, well, it, it yeah. doesn't operate uh, mm. in an open field. Uh, I mean, um, there, there will be control, but um, uh, it's so much a part of the process that I don't realise that it's being uh, applied, I suppose. I could say. Mm. Mm. So what about the relationship between the interior world and the exterior world? <laughs> and I'm thinking of some of those coat hanger works and the clothes on things. Mm. It seems to me there's this play yeah. of the exterior outside of us, but also the interior. And if you go back to as a child with all the books, sort of reading in a sense is an interior mm. sort of practice. How do, how do those two? And, and Nick Zerbrug and that lovely essay in the um, mm. 1994 um, QUT show Mm. wrote about that, that interior, exterior play in your work? With the, with the um, um, co-hangers, I think certainly there's some sort of play of a skeletal sort of uh, frame to the persona, the, the, the outward uh, appearance. And um, uh, <coughs> I mean, I think after seeing those shows that anybody would have been quite nervous about creeping into a wardrobe full of <laughs> wire coat hangers, you know, be haunted forever after. <laughs> but, um, see, I don't think my ideas come first. I think they're fertilised, as I said, by impressions and uh, sensations or whatever I might have and then uh, you know, somehow or other it becomes externalised. Yes, so, so, Madonna, what about more recently, how you've returned to painting and smaller pieces? <coughs> well, I try not to let um, life dictate to what happens in art. Mm. I know you can't, you know, discard it altogether. But all the time, all my life, I've been fighting against <coughs> fragile health. And now I've got widespread arthritis and um, all the, you know, to a certain extent, we don't realise how much the skill of our hands and our bodily members, et so, et cetera, are, I suppose, not only um, products of cerebral uh, impulses and so on, but the muscles answer to those, um, you know, sort of um, um, input as well. So you get to find that you're getting a bit of sort of old and creepy and um, um, then I come to doing, uh, although some of those pieces I did have help with them physically, you know, having a, someone to um, mm. do the heavier part of, of working on them. But I do, I do um, regret that. But then I thought, well, you know, trying to be positive about these things, uh, and it was, I thought it was a bit strange because I gave up doing large paintings because I couldn't cope with the size and the, the dimensions mm. of them. <coughs> um, to do collage. Now I'm giving up <laughs> constructions to do painting. But painting was my first love, I can't uh, 
deny that. What about Madonna in relation to some of the big movements in sort of art history, I suppose, if you look at collage, it goes back to Cubism, mm. and then much more recent than that, we had concrete poetry. Mm. Like how, how does your work sit against those things? And you were in that Cubism and Australian art exhibition. Yes. At Heidi. Um, well, it's only since I've gone back to painting that I realise that um, Cubism um, has been a very natural uh, development for me and I, I was very dumb in not realising that it was um, um, as important as it, has, as it has been because it provides that uh, armature to the emotional. Um, it's a horrible, destructive experience painting a um, for me an, an unstructured work or that's what I I, you know, like in the big collages, were the big ones that I've done, <clears throat> uh, I've had to um, master them, as it were, because otherwise, like, madness <laughs> lies in that direction, you know, and I couldn't cope with it, I couldn't, I couldn't contend with it, you know. I've been told on the best psychiatric um, authority that I have a very uh, rigid super ego, so maybe that's what. <laughs> Thank God for the the super ego. And, and I think it's a safety guard. I mean, I think the fact that I'm probably as sane as I am has a lot to do with. <laughs> um, but I have felt a lot of freedom, found a lot of freedom in the last couple of years. I think you know, sort of. Um, I've shrugged off a lot. You know, I, I don't feel. Um, I don't feel that I have to belong to any school or uh, ideology or whatever. I wonder about how you see yourself sitting, say, in Australian art, where oh. your positions. Isn't that a futile yes. exercise? Yeah, someone else will do it. But what, where do you see yourself sitting, I suppose? That, that, yeah. Well, I think it's important now that I'm the age that I am, I think that, as it's, again, that confers a certain um, freedom on you. I, I don't think at my age of 73 I have any obligation to be anything but who I am, you know. It's been a bit of a struggle getting here, but... <sighs> and I, I suppose the only other thing is, it seems to me that there's more sort of religious icons and symbols in your most recent work. Yes, well th that's true but uh, I'm not making any definite statements. I mean those paint little little sort of postcard c cartoon ones I've got. Um, a cat thinking on God, right. He may be thinking on God but he hasn't ma necessarily made up his mind. I mean he, he, he's not going to go to church unless he really wants to go to church and uh, he's quite happy where he is more or less at the time, just, 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 just sort of, just give me room. <laughs> and is there redemption after he eats the mouse? <laughs> after he eats the mouse? <laughs> oh, maybe, um, uh, may, may, maybe a, a, um, a, um, a, a sort of, um, <clears throat> What, what are, a sort of um, a force, a force of good will come and blow the the mouse out of the out of the frame. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Madonna, given your long career as an artist and as a poet, what words of wisdom would you give to someone who's seeking to be an artist, a poet, an artist of whatever kind today, just starting out? I, I hope you don't mind me mentioning your book, but there's a little book of. Um, Rollo Mays, who's a psycho psychologist, and it's called The Courage to Create. And I think that um, has a lot of wisdom in it. Um, and what, what can I say? Um, I think with all of us, uh, there come those moments when everything seems to fall flat and you know you, you, you feel completely exposed to um, negative ions etc etc um, 
no, no, no. And, and build, yeah, build, build a small uh, memorial, not, not a memorial because it's not gone, but a, a living memorial to what you believe in and what you think, you know, what, what has nourished you in the past, what, has, uh, what nourishes you now, and um, don't lose those particular signposts that have, uh, you know, sort of got you out of trouble in the past. We're all of us individuals. There's not sort of a, a series of hats, gloves and shoes that we can put on to sort of um, prepare us for travel along the road of life. And I feel it's rather arrogant to feel that you can actually, you know, I mean, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't have a good feel about myself if I sat here <laughs> telling other people what they should do with their lives or how they should progress and so on. So, and, and, and also, Bob, that's rather a sort of, uh, um, uh, how should I put it? It's, it's so well worn out, that question, that I don't think there's any wisdom left in it. <laughs> Sorry. The question or answer, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Madonna. That's really